Um, basically, to give you guys a bit of an idea, uh, my name is Tom Cowan, as you guys have heard. Uh, we are a specialist consultant. We, we specialize in oil and gas pipelines and terminals, and then all the associated uh, infrastructure around it. Um, to give you guys a bit of a background on EPCM, we're not a very old business, but we're a very good business. And um, we've been now for the last three years growing out of our brackets. We um, have, I keep on trying to say to people how many guys we are now, but I think we are now 100, which we're very proud of. Um, basically what we do is we, we focus on the oil and gas uh, space and we focus mainly on pipelines, terminals, up in Africa. If you have a look at our business, uh, basically we've got, uh, we've got facilities and offices in South Africa where we've got uh, Pretoria, where we mainly, this is our head office, there we've got about 30, 40 people um, in Pretoria. Then we've got a newly opened small office in uh, Cape Town. In Cape Town, we mainly focus on offshore infrastructure. So there we look at uh, importing facilities. So your, your SPMs that you bring in, your white product fuels, your uh, FSRUs. So really uh, near shore uh, importing facilities, we do quite a lot of from there. Then we go to Mozambique. In Mozambique, uh, we've got a facility in Matola. In Matola, we do quite a lot of... Uh, gas work mostly on the distribution side. Uh, there's a line that uh, is owned by a group called uh, MGC or Gigajoule. And I'm sure the Cresco guys would know that line even better than I do. Um, we connect into that line quite a lot. So from that line, which is from the Sassel uh, main gas line, we do connections where we take it from the tap into the line all the way to the commercial users that actually then use the gas. Then uh, we've got another base in Vilanculos. In Vilanculos we do quite a lot of work for, for Sassel. So we, uh, we've done a lot of work. Uh, my partner originally designed the MSP. He was an old Australian coming here to see what it's like and he got the MSP. And then he did the MSP pipeline for Sassel. And then also we've designed Loop 1 and Loop 2. And now we're just finishing off Loop 2, uh, the turnkey cathodic protection. Which if you guys are wondering, cathodic protection looks after the pipeline so that it doesn't corrode. So we're currently doing that for Sassel uh, in Tamane. Then we've got, uh, we've got a little newly set up entity in Kenya. We're bidding quite a lot to a group called KPC. We're trying to develop some more work there. We've been uh, shortlisted for uh, oil export, crude oil export pipeline, uh, Lokicha, Lamu, which we're waiting. We're hoping that would be the first good one in Kenya. Then Ghana, we're very active in Ghana. We've probably got about 40 guys on the ground currently in Ghana. We'll get to it when I show you guys some of our projects, but we do quite a lot of uh, existing fuel line refurbishment up in Ghana. Then Zimbabwe, there's not a lot of people that want to work in Zimbabwe. That suits us quite well. Uh, we do quite a bit of work in Zim. Uh, we're currently busy with uh, bi two bioethanol uh, storage tanks for NOIC, who's the, basically like the Zimbabwe oil company. And then we also do quite a bit of work in Baira, where you've got the CPMZ pipeline that feeds the, the storage facilities in Zim. What I'm going to try and do, I don't want to bore you with all our oil and gas jargon, but I think what would be cool to see is to also see how oil and gas is not just oil and gas. You know, it can be taken into various uh, areas, various sectors, and it's, it's actually quite wide. Uh, we've got a, a little pipeline. This is in South Africa. It's in the Free State. So we've got a little pipeline in the Free State. Um, basically what it is, they call it microbial gas. 
it's a lot of low pressure gas gathering it's a low pressure gas gathering system so they've got currently and it's from the 50s from the 50s they've they've got about 13 wells that's producing gas so <laughs> is that too close <laughs> So they've got 13 wells that produce gas from about the 50s. This is methane gas. What's very interesting is it's very clean gas. They've also got helium in their gas. So usually you don't get that. These guys have got about 4% helium in their gas. What's quite tricky for us, and but also quite nice, is there's not a lot of pressure. So it's very difficult to get your gas to a central location to, to actually do something with your gas. So for the last two, three years, we've been designing a network for them and uh, we're busy implementing this network now to gather all the gas and then to use the gas. So basically how this uh, project works is you've got your network that brings all the gas uh, to a central location. At that central location, you give it a bit of pressure because you need it. Then you take out the helium, so we're talking to Linda and those guys to take out the helium from the gas. Then what they're doing is once they've got the gas, they compress the gas. So they compress the gas into similar like you would see in a diving cylinder. So they take it to 250 bar and then they've got CNG trailers. <coughs> and what's quite nice and why I like this job is that it's on the Sabanya gold mine. So their market for this is that they've got mega bus in the area so what they're doing is they're going to fuel the buses that take the people to the mine with this gas so that's one of their users the other use is they're going to do uh, power generation so they've got um, they've got trigen where they're going to do steam and heat and all of those things and then also sell to the industrial sector Again, I think what is, what is quite nice to, again, talk about this job is that you, firstly, you've got the oil and, and gas component, but it also shows you that it goes into the transport component of, uh, of the game and logistics, and then also going further into the mines. I mean, one of the things that they're currently looking at doing is actually taking some of the methane down into the mine and uh, using it for the locos below ground. So in this way, you can actually get your, <coughs> your traditional oil and gas market into, into various other markets. And if you go, and I'm sure the financial guys would tell you, if you look at your clean burning methane and your LNGs and those things, you actually have a big saving if you've got enough volumes that you could make it viable and that could go into your logistics game and it can go into various other parts of the business. The other thing that I really like about this job is that it's the, it's the first low pressure gas gathering system in South Africa. So what that means is you've got shale gas on its way, you've got uh, coal bed methane, you've got all of those projects which is quite close to home that you could actually start servicing and it would be a very similar situation. It would be more difficult to get the gas out but that would be definitely be a possibility. <coughs> to give you guys a bit more insight on, let's say, this project and what they're planning for the future, is they've got 13 producing wells. Their idea is to drill another 400 in the next four to five years to get more volumes through this reserve. So it's something to take note of, and I think it's quite a, a new and a nice project for, for us to be involved with. The other project that I want to talk to you guys about uh, is a project that's been keeping me busy for also the last three years up in Ghana. Uh, we're very active in Ghana. We work for a company called BOST. Um, as you can see there, BOST has got quite a big uh, liquid network. BOST used to be the, or still, still is, the transnet of, uh, of Ghana. They used to have a lot of strategic stock that they kept for the country. Now they, three years ago, three and a half years ago, they changed their MDs and they got this uh, guy that keeps us very busy but is very, very dynamic and he, he pushes. Uh, when we got there, they had this whole facility 
and they were trucking. So they didn't have one pipeline running. So um, basically what we've done is we started in the north. Let me just get this thing working. So we started in the north for them. So we started uh, refurbishing this section, which then goes all the way up to Burkina Faso, uh, which is quite a, um, a long line for them. And then basically moved back south and we're currently refurbishing this section. Um, they've got a lot of new lines and gas and all of that uh, facilities planned. Um, but what is interesting is by the end of this year, they'll have this facility working. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting to see the big difference it makes to a country to, to have your infrastructure working compared to, to doing it the wrong way. They've also got big aspirations and big plans. Uh, these guys are actually trading currently. They're not just a, a throughput group. They've changed this group in from a, well, I'd like to say we changed it from a very broken organization into something that actually works. Um, they still have a lot of requirements. If you look at the, at the Ghana system, um, how it works currently is they get their product in from a, from a CBM, which is an 18-inch, it then goes through to the main depot and then gets distributed all the way up here north. And then you've got these barges that basically transport it uh, all the way north to the, to the north of the country. I mean, one of the major issues currently is that uh, with global warming and uh, they've got big hydros, they lose levels on this river. So... Um, their barges for a big portion of the year, their barges stop about 50 k's from, from the Boopi Depot. So again, it's, uh, it's big opportunities. There's, there's a lot of work to be done in Ghana. It's a very nice country to work, very nice uh, place to go, nice food. <laughs> we, uh, we really enjoy working there. And the same group has got a lot of uh, gas work and gas pipeline work that they busy rolling out. Um, the other thing that I'd like to just uh, show to you guys on this or just uh, tell you is that you know you you don't realize how broken some of these places in Africa is you know you you we live here and we all complain and we we are unhappy with the services but until you really go there and you see it's the basics it's not you don't have to reinvent the wheel there it's really the the basics that they're still battling with and um, there's big opportunities and it's uh, it's good crowds to work with as well then another job that's been a bit of a roller coaster and up and down it's kept me busy most of this uh, year trying to really fix it um, has been the uh, Horn of Africa pipeline so a uh, group, uh, Black Rhino, Blackstone, they're developing the Horn of Africa pipeline. It's basically a very big pipeline that runs from uh, Djibouti to Ethiopia. It's, a, it's an offshore import facility, so it's a five kilometer offshore line with the SPM. Goes to a very big tank farm, a 500,000 cube tank farm. And then about a 500 kilometer pipeline that takes fuel to Ethiopia. I mean, again, I'd like to emphasize this is not new, it's not rocket science, it's just they don't have it, uh, they're landlocked, they, they need access to the fuel. Um, this pipeline is, like they say, in the Horn of Africa. Uh, it's extremely difficult conditions. The Horn of Africa actually wants to break off, so that we don't have a Horn of Africa anymore. So there's quite a lot of seismic activities in that area. You know, so there's been a lot of stuff that we had to, to deal with on this job. Uh, and it, it gets back to your uh, investing money and putting money in a spot where you're not 100% sure if that investment is going to, to be okay for the next 30 years. You know, this was a classic example of this. Uh, this job has been going for about a year. Um, I did a big feasibility study on it. Uh, then they changed a lot of it, and they, they changed it again, and they changed it again, and uh, I think now we're back to the first feasibility study on it. 
And um, basically, from a project perspective, um, uh, the economics at the start was quite difficult, uh, but we got in and we, we've we got the, the CapEx values down to where it makes sense. Uh, I think everybody, contractors included, now realize that uh, we can't all just cream it on this project. We need to actually have a project, you know. And, and I'd like to emphasize that, you know, to everybody in the room here that uh, that is in this game or even in any other game, you know, is that if it doesn't work, it doesn't work for any of us, you know. So this is a classic example where we had really European-based guys uh, coming in and uh, giving to Africa what they do in Europe and uh, it just didn't fit our models, you know. So after a lot of time and effort, we managed to convince the guys that uh, it needs to be fit for purpose. and. Uh, tell you guys now we got the capex uh, from the start to where it is now it's almost the half of it and uh, suddenly we've got a job and uh, we've all got a job you know so that that's what I'd like to emphasize on this then I haven't prepared <laughs> beautiful slides for you guys on this but uh, Basically, what I want to try and talk to you about is uh, the contracting strategies in Africa. And I think that uh, it's very important that we, we all understand that uh, even the traditional consultant's role is becoming more and more difficult to, to execute. Uh, our market and even Africa is becoming more mature. Uh, in our game, we see a lot of uh, Chinese guys getting involved. We see the big Chinese EPC guys uh, coming in and taking everything. Um, but I also want to say that you shouldn't take that as a negative. You know, uh, we've been involved in Tanzania on a very big 550-kilometer, uh, 36-inch uh, gas pipeline. And the CPP, who's Chinese, uh, built and designed the whole job. Um, but... We were on the owner's side from a, um, from an owner's engineer perspective and a PMC perspective. And I mean, that job worked extremely well. So I'd like to emphasize and also say to all of you guys, you know, there's, there's a way around uh, doing work that you have to take the full cake. You know, and it gets back to what Paul was saying that, you know, you, you have to hunt in packs. And you need to understand where you can fit in. Um, something that we also see very often is the Chinese bring the money and that's why they can make the calls and that's why they can talk the talk um, and it's something for us to to learn and to pick up from and to understand that we need to as a package go and package these solutions because if you if you take Africa in most cases I mean our scope of work is about one page long you know, they don't have the skills to scope these things and, um, and basically give you all these formal docs that you can get a price very close. But it's also to your advantage because they're not as price sensitive as your, as your um, Europe's and the rest of the world. So it's very important that going forward that you, you actually look at strategic partnerships and how are you going to package a solution to a client and go and get it and go and take it rather than waiting for an RFQ or a tender doc to come out because I can tell you now that <laughs> you don't get a lot of these tender docs that's, uh, that's on the internet and every man and his dog is on it. You, know, you, you get the real business when you, you get on the ground and you, you make the right connections and you make the right... Uh, also partnerships to go and execute uh, a solution to to the client and not just uh, a single service offering and then lastly what i what i'd like to emphasize to you guys and i'd like to use my mozambican partner as a as a good example uh, when i got into vilankulos about it was probably seven or eight years ago i had this guy with this broken jeep it picked me up at the airport <laughs> and I think he was a taxi driver but I wasn't sure because he was trying to swing everything that he could to me and um, 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> we started talking and uh, eventually I was there to see who I could meet that we could work with. And uh, I had a lot of meetings and by the end of the week I thought, geez, the only guy I really like here is my taxi driver. <laughs> And now my taxi driver has been my partner there for about five years. So, um, old Abdul, we, we tease him. Um, I mean, he's got a driver now. He doesn't even come and fetch me at the airport anymore. <laughs> but, you know, he, he was a very good uh, personality. And he's a very good uh, street smart uh, guy in the country. You know, so talking about local partners, I mean, it's instrumental in what you do in Africa, you know, and you would be foolish if you try and do anything in Africa if you don't have the right local partners. And the success you've got in a country is, is based on your local partner. And that local partner doesn't have to be an engineer or expert or a doctor or anything like that. That local partner can be your taxi driver. But he needs, to, he needs to be street smart, you know, and he needs to be able to open up difficult doors for you. You know, we, um, for instance, we take things over the border quite a lot in Mozambique and those sort of things. It's all very difficult administrative processes. And if you get the right guys to support you, uh, it makes your life a lot easier, you know. So, so that's one example for you of a, of a local partner. Um, Another example I've got is, uh, is Ghana. I mean, in Ghana, we've got a man, and I'm sure he doesn't want me to say his name, but he's, uh, he's extremely connected in Ghana. He's uh, part of the, the, almost the royal family there of the uh, Ashanti region and the Ashanti tribe. And uh, his dad started Ashanti Gold. So um, very connected again. And <laughs> to tell you another story that might... Uh, give all of you guys, all of the scamsters an opening. Uh, we, we received an email from this weird guy from Ghana and <laughs> said, uh, do you guys want to do pipelines in Ghana? And we <laughs> said to him, well, um, you probably want to get my banking details first. <laughs> and then he said, no, I'm serious. Um, I'll see you tomorrow at your office. And we're like, uh, are you coming from Ghana? He says, no, he's, uh, he's staying in Santon. And uh, <laughs> that's how we met him. And uh, we were very weary of going to work up in Ghana. Um, West Africa, we didn't know what we were in for. Um, and I had a long discussion with Edwin and said, you know, Edwin, I, this is scary for us. You know, it's, it's the first one. And I mean, this guy was, uh, he was so good that he said, well, I can understand that you've got a risk here and you're not sure, but I really want you guys to come and support me here. So Edwin as an individual paid a whole, a whole job 100% upfront before we went the first time. You know, and uh, he's worth his weight in gold and you don't often get them. But uh, I think what's very important to, um, to take note of is that, you know, you... You don't have to find these guys in these fancy facilities and all Paul's visits or anything like that. You know, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of opportunities to to actually meet really good and uh, connected individuals, and it's uh, it's opportunistic a lot of cases. You know, and you um, you work with it, and you're also going to get burned probably. You know, you never know. Um, but I think it's extremely important that everybody that wants to play in Africa um, understands the value that your, your local component has got in making your life easier when you execute projects. Okay, thank you. Yep. I'm from Southern Mapping. Jesus. Let's just open that. And I'll be telling you about an interesting collaboration between Africa House and Southern Mapping. So Southern Mapping, Southern Mapping is a geospatial company. We, we provide various, various uh, surveying methods, including airborne, satellite, and field surveying solutions. We're based in South Africa, Tanzania, 
and we have subsidiary companies in Mozambique, Namib Namibia, and Botswana. We have an e extensive body of work across the African continent. That the last time we counted, we were about 700 projects in in 40 countries and across and 40 countries in Africa and the rest of the world. So we have a long, far-reaching relationship with with Africa House, and over the past few months, we've sat down, like Liz just mentioned, that we've sat down to ponder about how we can improve the project database. And what we've essentially done is taken the, the document and spatially enabled it, given, put it in spatial context where, and what this is, is a project, it's an online map that will come live in beginning of next year, January, January 2017. And what this essentially is will give you the opportunity to not only visualize, but interrogate, the, interrogate interactively with the project database. This, this, ladies and gentlemen, will be on a platform we're all familiar with, which is Google Maps. I think we've chosen the right platform here. Yeah? And what, what's so great about this, ladies and gentlemen, is that you're not tied to your computer or laptop. You can use your smartphone. I'm actually just looking at it right now. Please feel free to join and ask me about it later on. Your smartphone and tablet. And so basically, this is a s little snippet of how it will look. So how it'll work is that after each update, uh, frequently, depending on how frequently we update it, you, each subscriber, like Liz just mentioned, that three per company, each subscriber will get an online an email notification prompting them to open the map, and by clicking open, you'll be able to launch the map, and and immediately what you will see is that it tells you when the map was last updated, and you will have the option of selecting a satellite background or map background. You'll be able to hover and toggle over projects and by clicking on any project, let's get it there, a project pop-up should appear, will appear, and it will give you the project information such as country, sector of the project and a brief project description there as well as other information on the project. So what this will allow you to perform Attribu attribute filters. So if you're interested in projects in a specific country, you can filter by country. Let's say we're interested in all the projects in the Congo Republic or Djibouti. This, the, project, the projects in Djibouti will appear. And you can add several other filters to it. So if you're interested all in, let's say, all the agricultural projects in Kenya. You can just select Kenya there and add another filter, filter by sector, and choose agriculture. Let's look for agriculture. Okay, let's choose transport. Let's hopefully there's a transport, yes, there is a transport project in Kenya, and you'll be able to visualize that while every other Every other project has been, this is a subs will be a subset, <coughs> you'll be able to subset the projects and be able to visualize projects of your interest. Ladies and gentlemen, I should remind you that this, this is only a subset that we've chosen of the database. Once we go live in January next year, we'll have a full comprehensive, full comprehensive data set, the full comprehensive Afri Africa House project data set. And please, yep, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Please feel free to join me afterwards to have a a test, a test drive on tablet, see how it works. And I do thank you, ladies and gentlemen.